Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Maggie and I'm a professional MCAT tutor uh, wash up. Me and my brother John used to be professional MCAT tutors and now we're med students, but we still do the MCAT thing on our YouTube so that you guys can watch it and get tutoring basically for free. I think it's pretty cool. Today we're going to be going over the second CP passage in the new AAMC free practice exam. Without further ado, let's get into the passage. So first things first, see if there's a title. Oh, lovely biochemistry. Perfect. I know exactly what the passage is going to be about. So it starts out the NADH quinone oxidoreductase blah, 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 is a transmembrane protein that catalyzes the reaction between NADH and ubiquinone coupled to the pumping of sodium across the plasma membrane resulting in a sodium concentration gradient. Some people like to highlight their basic sciences. I know John really likes doing that, so I'm going to Try it out here. Transmembrane protein is definitely something you need to know. Oxidoreductase, like just oxidation and reduction as uh, reaction types. Catalyzes, so it's an enzyme, and we know that because it ends in uh, ASE. Um, coupled reactions. Um, they could ask something about the plasma membrane or um, a sodium concentration gradient across the plasma membrane, something like that. I actually am going to write down a little bit on my flow chart here. Um, I'm just going to say that this enzyme um, equals sodium concentration gradient. The electron transport chain in NANQR is composed of four flavins, FAD, FMNC, FMNB, and riboflavin, and a two iron, two sulfur center with electrons flowing in the direction NADH to FAD to the iron sulfur thing to FM. Y'all can read. So I do like how they're giving us this um, electron flow direction. That could come into handy later. I would not worry if you don't know what these things are. I don't know what they are. They're probably not going to ask you what they are. And if they do, then they're going to give you some more clues in the passage as to what they are. So I wouldn't worry about them now. Two electrons are transferred from NADH to FAD in the first step of the cycle, but all steps, subsequent steps are one electron transfers. So definitely keeping that in my head. Researchers were interested in observing whether sodium has a thermodynamic effect on electron transport. So here they're bringing in some thermodynamic. Working with purified sodium NQR from Vibrio cholerae, the researchers used spectroelectrochemistry to investigate the chemical changes that take place during electron transfer and how these changes are impacted by the presence of various cations. I love when they mention ions because they're a lot of times they ask easy questions about them. So now we are adding cations into the mix and seeing if that changes how this uh, enzyme works. Sodium NQR was diluted to a final concentration of... Ooh, 0.75 millimolar in uh, 0.15 molar uh, lithium chloride, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, what the F is RB? Chloride or ammonium chloride. Each solution also contained re redox active mediators. So the important thing in this is one, you notice that like the lithium, the sodium, like those are the source of our cations. And also you notice that um, units, they give us units here. So I definitely would highlight those if you ever come across them, because a lot of times you can do some, um, F, well, I was going to say easy math, but it's without a calculator. So none of it's easy, but a lot of times they will ask you like relatively simple, like molar math stuff. And if you've watched our molar math and stoichiometry video, then you know that those questions are typically, they have a formula to them. So, okay. So they diluted it with the cations and placed in a glass instrument cell with calcium fluoride windows. The cell was equipped with two gold grids, which served as working electrodes. So now we're adding electricity in here. The applied potential was varied from positive 200 millivolts, oh, more, more units, to negative 400 millivolts in 20 millivolt increments, and a visible spectrum was recorded at each potential after waiting 40 minutes. A computer was necessary to simulate the data since the individual spectral transitions overlap. Redox transitions were assigned based on the spectroscopic changes that took place at each potential. Some of the results and assignments are presented in table one. So. It's a, it's a lot going on here, and I'm not going to worry about any of it. Like, I really think that they're probably going to ask questions about um, simple stuff like cations and um, these units that they've given us. 
they cannot ask you a question about spectro electrochemistry. I don't know what that is. No one knows what that is. People who invented it don't know what it is. So just don't stress that they're giving you all this stuff. Just like stick to your basic sciences. And as you're going through, like try to try to understand it, obviously, but like, don't, don't stress that much that they're going to ask you a question about the inner workings of spectroelectrochemistry. Watch me say all this and then like question number one is going to be like, explain spectroelectrochemistry. Table one, midpoint potentials of the cofactors in sodium NQR from V. cholerae in the presence of different cations. So cool. So, so exactly what they were doing earlier, right? They wanted to see how this enzyme worked um, with different cations. So we got the midpoint potentials of that. I don't really know what uh, midpoint potentials means, but potential I know is like an electricity thing. Um, we have a note at the bottom here that says FL represents flavin, the redox active center in four of the five cofactors of the enzyme. So I'm not going to do too much here. I'm basically going to say we got cofactors here, the redox transition. I don't even know what that means. And then EM, which is probably going to be our potential because it's in millivolts versus versus she. I don't know what she is. She is the moment. I'm going to pay attention <laughs> in this graph to the fact that these are in millivolts and these are the cofactors because <laughs> that's mm, this test is kind of hard. OK, number five says what functional group transformation occurs in the product of the reaction catalyzed by uh, the oxidative reductase? So they asked us a question about something that we should know about. So like I said, this is an oxidoreductase. And not only that, we know that it's using NADH. So NADH is a reducing agent. It gets oxidized. So it is going to turn into NAD plus when this enzyme is finished with it. And whatever the other compound is that is with NADH, that compound is going to be getting reduced. So what I'm looking for here is a reduction reaction. And I just want, I just want a plain reduction reaction. I don't want, I don't want any special stuff. That's, there's different enzymes for that. Oxidoreductase is just like strictly reduce. So is A a reduction reaction? Yeah, right? I mean, carbonyl to alcohol, that's like classic. Classic reduction reaction is going to be your carboxylic acid going to... Um, what am I drawing? Your carboxylic acid going to an aldehyde and that going to an alcohol. So this is the part we have here. It's, it's a, it's not an aldehyde. It's a ketone, but still the, the same rules apply. It's a ketone to an alcohol. So I like a, what kind of reaction is B? It kind of looks like a reduction reaction because you end with an alcohol on one side, but I want y'all to look closely. You also end, you have a phosphate on this uh, left side and you end with an inorganic phosphate on the other side. And what enzyme catalyzes the reaction that takes a phosphate off of a molecule and ends with an inorganic phosphate. We're not putting the phosphate on another one. That would be a kinase. But in this, in this case, we are just taking it off and it ends up as an inorganic phosphate. And that would be a phosphatase that does that, not an oxidoreductase. So C actually shows, we have an interesting, we have an um, amide right here, and we're ending with a carboxylic acid and an amine. The only like example that I can think of that like, really does this a lot would be like um like the peptide bonds the proteins that break peptide bonds which are proteases um there's probably like other ones that that do a, that do that same reaction if even if it's not a protein but anyway not an oxidoreductase for sure d again looks like um <clears throat> Like it could be a reduction reaction because we're starting out, I mean, we're, we're ending with alcohols on one side. And to me, like alcohols is always like reduced, like that's very reduced. But if you'll notice, we start out with an ester and we end with a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So if you can think back to reactions where you started with an ester and you ended up with a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, I think of saponification, which is done by, uh, um, not oxidoreductases. It is done, um, I know by like lipases and stuff, I think, like with um, triacylglycerol and um, breaking it down into glycerol and fatty acids. That's an example of a time when um, like lipases can do it, but it's not, the moral of the story is it's not an oct oxidoreductase. Like it might be a hydrolase. Is it a hydrolase? Yeah, I think it's a hydrolase. 
Okay, we've established it's not an oxidoreductase, so A is the correct answer here. Number six says, what is the chemical structure of a component found in four of the five cofactors used by the oxidoreductase? So it's probably talking about a uh, flavin because we had the note that flavin was in four of the five cofactors. So, Jesus Christ, I mean, this question's asking, like, what is a flavin? What is the chemical structure of a flavin? So if you don't know this, I'm guessing I would put it on a card. This is not something that I would have like predicted that you need to know, um, but I'm guessing you do. I would put it on a card. Um, this is adenine. I know that. And then you should know this is histidine, which is an amino acid. And I just looked this up and it's ubiquinone. <laughs> and this is flavin. So um, pretty simple question if you read that little note at the bottom of the table that flavin was in four of the five cofactors and if you knew a, such a niche fact like what flavin looks like but you can definitely write like you can definitely mark out like a and d um, because you should know definitely like what those look like ubiquinone geez i guess you need to know all right number seven says what is the ratio of cation to enzyme in the spectroelectrochemical experiments described in the passage so this is where um, these units are going to come in handy so we have um the enzyme was 0.75 millimolar, and all the cations were uh, 0.15 molar. So that's a pretty big difference. And be careful also, because if they had put a um, molecule that was like a cation 2 and 1 anion, then you would have to take into account the concentration once these dissociated, because the concentration of the cation is actually going to be double whatever the concentration of the full molecule is once they dissociate, because there's two cations for every like one molecule, if that makes sense. But we don't have that problem here, because they are monovalent. So it was 0.75 millimolar, and I'm just going to go ahead actually and change that to um, no scientific notation. So milli is to the negative three. 0.75 times 10 to the negative three versus 0.15 normal. So this is enzyme and this is cation. So there's obviously a lot more cation, right? So we can go ahead and mark off A. Is there more than double? Heck yeah, right? Like this is like, this is actually 0 0.00075 versus 0.15. So it's definitely more than two to one. Is it more than 20 to one? So honestly, this is how I would figure this out. Like I would think, what is this times 20? I would just multiply it by 20. Even if we, look guys, let's erase some of this. Even if we rounded this up to just 1.0 times 10 to the negative three times 20, what you would get would be 20 times 10 to the negative three, which is 0.02. And that's with a pretty significant round. And 0 0.02 is not even close to 0.15. So it's not going to be C. You're going to be closer hitting the head with 200 to 1 when you consider the difference between 0.75 times 10 to the negative 3 and 0.15. So that's what I would do with those math questions. Just round and like shortcuts if you can. Number eight says the reaction between NADH and ubiquinone is exergonic. Boom. But the reaction when catalyzed by the enzyme does not generate much heat in vivo. What factor accounts for this difference? So what does exergonic mean? Exergonic means it releases energy, um, usually like exothermic, spontaneous, like all these words should kind of come to mind when you hear exergonic. Now you guys might be thinking, well, why does this reaction have to be catalyzed if it's um, spontaneous? And I urge you not to get things mixed up. Cat catalysis and enzymes are all about rate and kinetics. They have nothing to do with thermodynamics. This reaction could be exergonic, could be spontaneous, but it could take a thousand years to actually complete. And when you add an enzyme in, it really just speeds things up, but it doesn't actually change um, like the amount of energy that is being released um, like as a result of this reaction. And that is my little crappy energy diagram, sorry. So, okay, so when it's catalyzed, it doesn't generate much heat. Now, I think an important thing here is that it says in vivo, and in vivo means inside the body. Um, as opposed to like in a petri dish. So really, like I don't, I don't know the answer to this like right off the top of my head. So I'm gonna have to go through and kind of just hope that all of them, except for the correct answer, like just don't make logical sense. Um, 
It says the reaction catalyzed by the enzyme in vivo A is more exothermic as a result of the lower activation energy. So yes, enzymes do uh, lower activation energy. That is their whole point. If we're going to go back to this little energy diagram, like the hump that this has to get over is called activation energy. And yeah, we've lowered it from its previous height, but that doesn't make it any more exothermic. Exothermic all has to do with thermodynamics, which is like the difference in the amount of energy that the molecules contain from the start to the end of the reaction. So no, that doesn't make sense because enzymes don't change thermodynamics. B says occurs sequentially. The reaction um, catalyzed by the enzymes occurs sequentially in several small steps. So I, I don't know. And I also don't care. It's kind of a, a logical leap to say that we know that it occurs in several small steps. And it also, it, it wouldn't matter. Like again, it, yes, enzymes can catalyze things in, in several uh, small steps, but again, they don't change thermodynamics and thermodynamics is changed um, as a result of this enzyme. So, so what is it about this? It's not something normal like that it's catalyzed in uh, sequentially in several small steps. It's not going to be, that doesn't not, that's not going to change thermodynamics. C, maintains a large separation between the reacting centers. One, I don't know how that would occur. Like these enzymes like bind like straight up in the, I mean the ligands bind straight up in the enzyme pockets. Um, there's usually not a large separation between the reacting centers. Also like with an oxidative reductase, like you have to like physically move those electrons. So not loving it. I'll say maybe just because like, I don't know, everything else is suck. D, um, the reaction catalyzed by it in vivo is coupled to the movement of a charged particle across a concentration gradient. So now that makes sense because we know that the reaction is coupled, right? It says it right here that um, the reaction is coupled to the pumping of ions across the plasma membrane. So that's probably the reason why we do this reaction in the first place. It's like the same reason why we use ATP because it's energetically um, favorable. And so we can kind of use that reaction to power other reactions. We couple them. So that means that that energy that's released in the exergonic reaction is actually going to be harnessed and used um, to move the charged particles against their concentration gradient, move the sodium against the concentration gradient across the plasma membrane. So we're not going to be able to measure much heat because heat is like excess energy and we don't have much excess. We've used it all. So that is a great answer. Okay. That CP passage was like low key hard, but I hope you guys got something out of it and that it makes more sense now than when you first tried it. If you like videos like this, then honestly you will love our channel. We do videos like this all the time where we break down passages. We did the entire double AMC sample test and now we're doing the double AMC um, MCAT official prep free practice exam. So stick around, give this video a like and hit subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Also check out all of our projects in the description below. We have a ton of stuff going on. We have a discord you can join and just rant about the MCAT. Like things are, things are great. The vibes are good. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one.